Our subject for today, the impotence of omnipotence. What did I say? The impotence of omnipotence. Welcome to those who are watching online. Welcome, Fairview Village. If you guys have, I normally don't like you to have your smartphones on, but you know, when we have an opportunity to bless others, go ahead and hit share and start a watch party. And if you're watching online, just share it to others because you may have friends online that have not had the privileges that we have. And so share them, but put it on silent, put it off to the side, pull out your Bible, dust it off, and follow along with Pastor Randy Skeet. I'm so thankful that we have Skeet here today with us. God has sent him here to speak to us. I uh, was able to uh, work as a Bible instructor for a time in Michigan, and I lived there in Ann Arbor where Pastor Randy Skeet is uh, living as well. He is an evangelist, he's a missionary, he's a preacher, and God has inspired my heart and my soul through the words that God has put through this man. And I've always remembered, I remember watching him online one time, and he told the story of, you know, because I don't know if you guys know, but he has most of the Bible memorized, if not all of it. But he was sharing one time how one day he closed the Bible, and I'll never forget that, the words left his mind. So he always will have the Bible open, and if you're following along, you will see that it's as if he's reading right off your page, because the Lord is alive. And God did not give him a photographic memory. God just gave him the willpower to spend time and to take it piece by piece. And we have a new year today. You guys can do the same thing. Start this year by putting some of God's word in your heart so that you will not sin against him. May God bless each and every one. May God bless the manservant of the hour today, Randy Skeet. He will be the next voice you will hear. God bless you. There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life there is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty in blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth, that it may bring forth and bud. The Desire of Ages, page 20, paragraph 2. What that paragraph is saying, or that passage, everything created by God was created to serve something else. Only the sinful heart of man focuses on itself. Even in the Godhead, it is the other, because love is other-centered. That's why God, the Godhead cannot be one person. Love must have someone on which to pour out itself. And so we thank God for his love as expressed in the gift of his son. We thank him for you. Thank him for your love for his word that has brought you not only to this place, but that has brought you online, allowing you to fellowship with us in this way. I welcome those of you watching who are not Seventh-day Adventists. Wherever you are, thank you very much for your love for the Word of God and for your affection for us. And I ask the God of generosity, the God of goodness, to bless you for your participation with us and to bless you so much that you will feel that divine urge to fellowship with us again. If there's anyone listening who has contracted the coronavirus, I want you to know I am praying for you and will be praying for you. We serve a God who says of himself in Exodus 15, 26, 
I am the Lord that healeth thee. We serve a God of whom it is said in Psalm 103, verse 3, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, and of whom the psalmist says in Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them. And so I'll be praying for anyone who may have contracted the coronavirus, that the Lord will deliver you, and hopefully by that exercise of divine mercy, your heart will be touched to, be, to come closer to your God, because the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Thank you very much. Our subject for today, the impotence of omnipotence. What did I say? The impotence of omnipotence. Before I get into that, please, wherever you are, particularly online, preserve an atmosphere of reverence. As I said last night, the fact that we're worshiping online does not one whit alter the holiness of God. God is always holy. Whether you worship him at the backside of a mountain, as in the case of Moses, or in the most holy place, as in the case of the high priest, or in Solomon's temple, or in this building, God's holiness remains the same. Let us preserve reverence wherever we are. Favor number two, pray for me while I'm speaking. All I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. This is a very earnest and serious request. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I want God. It's a miraculous thing. The divine God to put his divine word in my mouth of clay. We have this treasure where? In earthen vessels that the glory may be of God. It has to be God because clay and dirt cannot do this. And so ask God to give me the words and the right attitude. And favor number three, I want you to concentrate and think. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together. This is God inviting us, come, let's reason. God is reasonable and he's a reasoning God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for life. Thank you for freedom of worship, which we still enjoy. Thank you, dear God, for the technology that allows us to worship this way and that allows a preacher to stand in Pennsylvania somewhere and be watched all over the world. Dear God, if we've offended you, forgive us, Father. You love to forgive. That's why Calvary exists. Cleanse me in a very special way because it is my heavy, heavy duty to handle spiritual things. Tell me what to say. Tell me when to say it. Tell me how to say it. And by the constant work of your Holy Spirit, dear God, keep my carnal nature under suppression, that your glory alone may be my focus. Bless all those listening. A very special blessing on all the visitors who were not Seventh-day Adventists. A Father, an even more special blessing on all the little children who may be watching, little boys and little girls. Touch them, dear God because Jesus was their age at some point in his life. Now, Father, be merciful to anyone who may have contracted the coronavirus. In the powerful healing name of Jesus Christ, touch them, dear God, and deliver them. And may that expression of mercy draw them to you. Heal anyone, Father, listening to me who may have contracted that virus. Rebuke it, Father, and restore them to health, I pray. Now I commit this message to your glory. May it bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a look at Jesus Christ. Let us go to John chapter 1. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject the impotence of omnipotence. John chapter 1, reading from verse 1. John is a very beautiful book, and I heartily recommend it to you. Study the Gospel of John. It was written by the man of whom Ella White says he most perfectly of all the disciples developed the character of Christ. 
So you were listening to the words of a man who knew Christ intimately by his own choice. There is nothing to prevent you from being close to Jesus. Make it your choice. John 1, reading from verse 1, I read from the King James Version of the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now we're taking a look at Jesus. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's a very powerful statement. All things, were, except sin, of course, were made by him. If you look at verse 1, we identify two personalities. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. We have two. Verse 2 repeats that sentiment. The same, that's the word, was in the beginning with God. So we have a plurality of persons. But verse 3 says, all things were made by him, not them, by him. Now let me say quickly, this him was working for the Father. Are you with me? Because Christ is the agent of the Father in creation and in salvation. But it was Christ himself who did the creating. And so the Bible says all things were made by him. Now focus on this and listen microscopically. Without him was not anything made that was made. Nothing can exist except from sin without Christ. That includes the sun, the moon, the grass, the atmosphere, the fish, the birds, and humanity. Nothing can exist without the Creator. You can then understand why the Bible says in Acts 17 verse 28, In Him we live and move and have our very being in Christ. Remove Christ and there is no existence. In him we live and move and have our being. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know the word is referring to Jesus Christ in verse 1. Verse 14 clarifies that beyond any controversy. That's why you study the Bible here a little and there a little, line upon line. What else? Precept upon precept. It is an approach Adventists use that allows us to come to such correct conclusions on our basic fundamental doctrines. Now, we have just learned a little about Jesus. Let's add to that by speaking the words of someone witnessing about Jesus. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 and listen to someone talking about Jesus as that person talks to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read from verse 10. Well, let's read from 8. In Hebrews 1, the Father is speaking to the Son. Follow me closely. We are allowed to eavesdrop by reading the Word of God. The Father is speaking to the Son. Verse 8 of Hebrews 1, and I ask my Father again to put his words in my mouth as I speak about his exalted Son. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now we're taking a look at Jesus. Our subject is the impotence of omnipotence. God the Father calls Jesus God. Thy throne, O God, God the Father declares that Jesus has a throne, which means Christ has a kingdom. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. A scepter is something a king carries in Africa. Some leaders carry a fly swat, the tail of an animal, or a stick or a staff. A scepter is a visual symbol of kingly rule and authority. Christ's scepter is righteousness. Verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. 
Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The father continues to speak. Listen closely as he speaks in verse 10. Referring to Jesus Christ the son. God is about to say something about Jesus that people still argue about. God is about to identify Jesus Christ as the creator of heaven and earth. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Stop. This is God the Father. And he's talking to his son and about his son, and he's talking to us about his son. And God the Father says, and thou, Lord, in verse 8, he calls him God. In verse 10, he calls him Lord. And the Lord is someone who deserves the obedience and the allegiance of subjects. Many people want Christ as Savior, but not as Lord. He is both. As Savior, we say, deliver me from sin, and then let me lead my life. No, Jesus says, if I am your Savior, I must also be your Lord, the one who tells you what to do, and you obey me. And so the Father identifies his Son as God. He identifies him as Lord. Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. So Christ is identified by the Father as the Creator. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. What is God saying? His Son is eternal. This heaven and this earth, marred by sin, will pass away. They shall perish, but thou remainest. There is a contrast between that which is perishable and that which is eternal. And God the Father identifies Jesus Christ as an eternal being. Verse 12, and they all shall wax old as a garment. Verse 12 now says, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. The Father is elevating, let me create a word, the eternality of God, of Jesus Christ. He is eternal. This is from the lips of the Father. There are some Adventists who will tell you Jesus had a beginning. No, he didn't. Then you're contradicting God. You're contradicting God the Father and his plainly spoken testimony of his son. Now, we know from the lips of God that Jesus laid the foundation of the earth. Let's go to Psalm 90. Our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. Psalm 90. 9-0. Listen to the psalmist. Under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, here's what the psalmist writes. God, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Who formed the mountains? By the lips of God himself in Hebrews 1 verse 10, Jesus Christ. And the psalmist is saying the same thing in the Old Testament. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. That's the best way a human pen in the hand of the Spirit can express the eternal nature of the Creator. He doubles up on everlasting. We're taking a look at Jesus. Now, this Jesus, we've discovered he is God. I didn't say he's the Father. I said he's God. Can you say amen? All right. This Jesus we discovered, he is eternal. He's everlasting. This Jesus we discovered, he is the creator. Yes, at the will of the Father, but it was he who created. Having said all of that, we go back to John chapter 1. Let's go back to John 1, 1, not 1, 1, John 1, verse 14, I should say. John chapter 1, verse 14, our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. Before we read that verse, let me pray again. Father in heaven, continue to restrain my carnal nature. Restrain me completely. 
Let me simply be a loudspeaker in your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John 1, 14, listen carefully. Keep in mind as you read 14 that we read in verse 3, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Keep that in mind as you listen to verse 14. And the word was made, what? Flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This eternal being, this God as witnessed by the Father, this Lord as witnessed by the Father, this creator as witnessed by the Father came in our human condition. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God is a mystery, was manifest in the flesh. Isaiah 9, 6 calls him the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Not that Jesus is the Father. The everlasting Father may be translated the Father of eternity. Eternity flows from Jesus. He came to this earth in this flesh now. While he was on the earth, let's see how powerful he was. Let us go to Mark chapter 4. We'll read from verse 37, our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. Mark chapter 4, reading from verse 37. I read from the King James Version. I don't recall if I told you that. The Bible says, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? They were traveling with the one who said, let there be light. They were traveling with the one who said, let the earth bring forth grass. They were fearful. Verse 41 of Mark 4. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this? Finish the verse, that even the wind and the sea obey him. This is the same God of Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2. From everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Now he is cumbered with humanity, but he's still God and the wind recognizes him. Don't ask me how the wind recognizes God. I have no clue and I need no clue. I accept thus said the Lord. Don't ask me how the ravens understood when God commanded them to feed Elijah and they had to know who Elijah was, where he was, what time to bring the food, and what food to bring. The Bible says God can command the clouds to not release their rain, Isaiah 5 verse 6. How that happens, I don't know. But I do know that when Christ rebuked the wind, it ceased. When Christ rebuked the sea, there was a great calm. This is God in human form, and he still has power. Now, let's go to John 11. John 11, our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. John 11, verse 43, Christ is at the tomb of Lazarus. The Bible says, John eleven forty three, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with the grave clothes. Jesus, the one who said, let there be light, is the one who said, Lazarus, come forth. This is power. 
His words brought life from death. By the way, it is he of whom the Bible says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. When Christ raised Lazarus, he stood outside the grave. He did not go in. When he comes the second time and raises all the righteous dead, he stands even farther away. He will be somewhere in the atmosphere, and then we will rise to meet him. But his voice covers any distance. This is omnipotence. Having reviewed a part of the resume of Jesus, let's go now and be politely shocked. Let's go to Matthew 13. Our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. Let's look at the impotence, if that's a proper word to apply to the creator. But I think you understand, or you will in a minute. Matthew 13, we will read the last verse of that chapter. Do you have it? Matthew 13, the last verse of that chapter. The Bible says... And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, who was this that could not do anything spectacular? In other words, who was this who seemed to demonstrate some weakness, some impotence, some inability to do something amazing? It's the one who said, let there be light. But the Bible says he did not many mighty works there, and the explanation is given because of the unbelief. But Mark is a little more harsh or bold or blunt. Let's go to Mark. He is recalling or recounting the very same incident. Here is how he expresses it. Mark 6, reading verse 5 and verse 6. Mark 6, 5 and 6, our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. You have Mark chapter 6, reading verse 5. And he could, he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them. Verse 6 says, and he marveled at their unbelief. And he could there do no, he couldn't do it. Who is this that couldn't do it? The creator. The impotence. Not that Christ is impotent. You get my point. But he was, un you see, God does not reward unbelief. It is an insult to God. Unbelief is an insult to God because unbelief is a refusal to believe, thus saith the Lord. Let me slow down and say it again. I'll say it differently. The only way to doubt God is to doubt his word. The only way to believe in God is to believe his word. The people in his village where he was and couldn't do anything spectacular, they did not believe his word. Now, when you disbelieve the word, here is why it is such an insult to God. Let's go to Genesis 1. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. Let me again thank those of you online for joining us. God bless you. I really mean it from my heart. God bless you. Shouldn't be too hard to find Genesis 1, chapter 1, reading from verse 1. The Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said. When you say something, what are you using? Words. What is Jesus called? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. What does the Bible call him? He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the A and the Z. And God said. And God spoke. And God used words. In the book, Education, page 126, paragraph 4, the servant of the Lord writes these powerful words. The creative energy 
that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Listen again. The creative energy. Now, only God can create. Human beings can manipulate what God has created. So we take metals and we take whatever. We manipulate what God has created. No human being can create because creation means to call into existence something out of nothing. And so the word of God, he spoke. Let there be light. He just used words. For every day of creation, the creator used words. When we doubt the word of God, we essentially doubt his ability to create. We question his status as creator because the universe came into existence by the word of God. Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1081, Paragraph 1. God spoke and his words created his works in the natural world. Nothing was created outside the word of God. When this word is doubted, do you begin to see the insult to God? To doubt God's word is to doubt God himself, the very essence of God. And God thinks so highly of his word, he tells us in Psalm 138 verse 2, he has magnified his word above all his name. Jesus came to Nazareth. They would not believe his word. And because of that, he could not do any mighty work there. Matthew said he didn't do it. Marx is less tactful, and he said he couldn't do it. You and I are gathered for prayer. Watch and pray. When we pray, we have to pray in what? faith but there is no faith outside of the word of god romans 10 17 faith cometh by hearing come on and hearing by the word of god this faith is leaning your entire weight on the word of god faith is taking god at his word Faith is submitting your mind, your will, your body, your strength, your intellect to the Word of God. Just before Jesus marveled at the unbelief of those in his hometown, Mark 6, verse 6, he had marveled at the belief of the centurion. Are you with me? He marveled two things in the Gospels made Christ marvel. And I often ask, how do you do something to make the Creator marvel? How? Here is someone who can say, let there be light, and the light comes. Let there be a firmament, and it comes. How can you do something to impress God? But the Bible says Jesus marveled at the faith of the centurion. The Bible says Jesus marveled at the lack of faith. How can you not believe a word that says, let there be light and the light comes? How can you not believe a word that says, angels come and the angels came? Because angels were also made by the word of God. Psalm 148, go there with me. Reading from verse 1, our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. Psalm 148, reading from verse 1, we read 1, 2, and 5. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him all his angels. Praise ye him all his hosts. Skip to five. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. The angels were created by the word of God. Those mighty beings, they came into existence out of absolutely nothing. Only the word of God can do that. But where unbelief exists, the word of God, that power is not released. It's like Superman in the presence of kryptonite. 
just can't do anything. Are you following me? He has the power, cannot express it. Go to Psalm 115. Let's read from verse 1 our subject, the impotence of omnipotence. Psalm 115, reading from verse 1. And see how God is so frequently embarrassed by our lack of faith. Psalm 115, reading from verse 1. I'll pray again, Father. As I proceed through this message, which will not be long, continue to pour your spirit into me, not for my sake, Father, but for the sake of truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Now listen carefully. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? Where is their God? Let's modernize that. Where is the God of the Adventists? They have as much cancer as the rest of the world. The divorce rate is as high as the rest of the world. Their children are as rebellious as the rest of the world. They are theologically confused as the rest of the world. They are, where is their God? What's the point of this message we call affectionately present truth? We see no effect in your life. You live as if you have no God. And so the heathens are saying to the Israelites who had disobeyed God and God could not demonstrate his power in their lives, where is their God? Embarrassment for God. But verse 3, but our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Our unbelief does not weaken God, but it makes God look weak. Let me say it again. Our unbelief does not weaken God, it makes God look weak. And so our prayers become weak. Our worship is weak. Because these things are not founded on faith in the word of God. My brothers and sisters, we are in a time when we must accept the word of God with a totality that will approximate recklessness. Here's how I usually explain it, my favorite way. I hope it is effective. What's the color of this Bible? You took too long, can you see it? What's, okay, it's black. Now, if the Bible says this is white, even though you see black, finish my words, you must say white. That's faith in the word of God. Because God's word goes absolutely contrary to the standards of the world. God's word says the seventh day is the Sabbath. Overwhelmingly, the world says no, Sunday. And so you see Sunday... But you have to say, Saturday. The other examples I can give, but I don't want to cause embarrassment. We're fast approaching a, a point in this world where people don't see the point of marriage for the sake of having children. A pastor was preaching in the church once and he said, children are for marriage, which is what the Bible teaches. A member went to him and asked him to apologize. Apologize for truth. But when something becomes widespread and persistent, it begins to look normal. Are you listening to me? It begins to look normal. That's why God told the Israelites, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6 from 4 to 9. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. These words which I command thee shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt speak of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Make it normal. By constant, constant, constant repetition so that your children, everywhere they turn, they see this and then this becomes their lives. It is a divine form of brainwashing with your permission, you see. Everywhere they turn, before they go to bed, as soon as they arise, outside of the house, in the house, that's how the devil functions.
We have to trust the word of God. The Bible says, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That word is as certain and as reliable as let there be light and there was light. That word is as certain as let the earth bring forth grass and the grass came. Because it proceeds from the mouth of the same person. You return my tithe. I will bless you beyond your expectation. Jesus said in response to the devil, Man shall not live by bread alone, finish the verse for me, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And by the way, what Jesus meant was, but by, by every commandment. He was referring to the Ten Commandments when he said that. Maybe if I have time this afternoon, I will show you that biblically. He was referring to the Ten Commandments because his ancestor, one of them, Solomon, said, keeping God's commandments, this is the whole duty of man. Question for you, don't answer me. Is God impotent in your life? Because of unbelief. Can it be said of you and your relationship with God, he could do no mighty miracle in her life because of unbelief. And then you look across the pew and you see how God is blessing some other person and you're jealous and envious and resentful, not realizing that person has put faith in the word of God and you haven't. God always honors faith. The Bible says without faith, come on, finish it, it is impossible. And the only way to have faith is in God's word, which means you and I must make the word of God our lifestyle. This morning, I was telling Sister Angela, I'll tell her now, I spoke at 7 o'clock this morning for church in England. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be 5. They're 5 hours ahead of us, and I miscalculated. And I thought I had to speak at 5 this afternoon because they met at 12 noon, but they're ahead of us. And I had, to speak, I had to jump out of the bed, and the Lord woke me up. And I thanked him, and I made a special financial offering to him for just waking me up on time to rush down and speak to God's people in England because I had confused the time. What am I saying? This morning, noon, night, this. Trusting the word of God. Living by the word of God. Praying through the word of God. When Jehoshaphat, and I'm closing, prayed because he was under threat from three armies, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. If you read his prayer from verse 6 to 12, he keeps calling on God. He says, art not, art not thou God in heaven? And the Bible says he is. And rulest not thou over all the nations of the earth? The Bible says yes. And is it not power in thine hand? The Bible says yes. So uh, Jehoshaphat was praying biblically, and when you present God with his word, God will not avoid it or ignore it. Let me place this on your mind, your heart, before I close. Preachers say I'm closing five or six times. But I am closing. God is not obligated to you or me. He is obligated to his word. Now, if the word is in you, when God fulfills that obligation, where is it fulfilled? In you. Ah, you missed it. It's my fault. Let me try again. If you pull the pin from a hand grenade and you throw it, it'll explode somewhere away from you. Are you following me? If you pull the pin and hug it to your bosom, it explodes in you. Now, God's word is a hand grenade full of power that saves, not blows you up. It puts you together. <laughs> 
you pull that pin of faith in your heart, when it explodes, it releases saving power. It releases transforming power. It heals diseases. It brings back the wandering family member back to the truth. It clarifies your thinking. When the word of God is fulfilled in you, let me repeat with respect, God owes you and me nothing. You cannot place God under obligation to creation. God is obligated to his word. And he'll always, always fulfill his word because the word of God cannot be broken. I call upon you in the presence of this holy God. Reevaluate your attitude towards thus saith the Lord. Take it as it reads. Believe it. We charge God with being unfair and unfeeling and unkind because we do not approach him in faith. We do not take him at his word and consequently God cannot do what he desires to do for us. I told you earlier, God does not bless unbelief. Jesus lived by faith in the word of God. In John chapter 8 verse 29, Jesus testifies this way, and he that have sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Focus on that statement. I do always those things that please him. Jesus said, my object was always to please the Father. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if Jesus pleased God, what kind of life did Jesus live? A life of faith. And the only way to live a life of faith is to live a life by the word of God. And Jesus Christ himself said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And when Jesus said man, he included himself. The impotence of omnipotence in the absence of faith. We tend to see God as omnipotent. He's doing nothing. God will never reward doubt. Your faith does not have to be mountainous like Mount Rushmore, but you must exercise all that you have. Like the father in Mark 10 who brought his epileptic boy to be healed, the disciples couldn't heal him, and he said, if thou canst do anything, have mercy upon us and, and help us. And Jesus says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. The man said, Lord, I believe, and he cried, help thou my unbelief. Ellen White said, when you say that prayer, you cannot be lost. Help my unbelief. This is all the faith I have. Jesus says, that's all the faith I need from you. I just need what you have. God does not require Elijah's faith from you. He requires your faith from you. And this is all you have. Exercise it. And when you exercise this, God responds with that. Ah, you missed it again. When you exercise this amount of faith, God responds with that. We see that in how God rewards people. None of us has lived forever. Even if we, re we, we live righteous lives, we have not lived forever. Yet, God rewards us with life forever. Those of us who live sinful lives, he rewards us with this amount of punishment. It's brief and he blots you out. He does not let you suffer forever. So when God rewards, he rewards all. When he punishes, he punishes only so much. If you love God, say amen. I love God and I like God. He is a nice person. Believe his word. Obey it. I know we hate the word obey. It causes us to uh, gag. The carnal nature gags on the word obey. But it is life to the believer. Obey God. Do what God tells you. God will bless your life. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the power of our Savior. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the angels that excel in strength. Lord, all the power of heaven is available for the weakest sinner who needs it. Help us to believe that day, God, all the power of heaven. 
is available to the weakest sinner who exercises whatever little faith he or she has. Dear God, forgive us for lack of faith. You are not angry with us because our faith is little. You are concerned with because we do not express that little faith. If we have faith as a mustard seed, says Jesus, we shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and it will move. Please, God, give us a dose of divine common sense to make the connection between faith and the exercise of your power. Let us stop making you look weak and impotent because you are omnipotent. Bless everyone who heard the message, dear God. If I said something I should not have said, forgive me, Father. And may the words that your people heard long remain in their hearts. And let that living word that made heaven and earth transform their lives. Help us to live by faith that grows every day. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen.